Acts chapter 24 uh, is where we are uh, on tonight. For those that are online, um, thank God for you joining us on today. Uh, we are in Acts 24, prayerfully we're going to get through um, actually Acts 25 verses 1 through 13. Um, my hope is that we can get through all those parts and pieces because of uh, the tie-in of these three individuals that we're going to talk about. And I had to go through and, and make sure that um, I could at least get the beginning parts of King Agrippa, uh, King Agrippa II, uh, in there because the historical components are going to lay into a lot of biblical pieces that we've already been talking about during the course of the study in Acts, and specifically with Paul. So with that being said, um, one, I'm going to need a little bit of water to get my water from the glass. I've got left right up there. Um, and just to go through the process of this lesson tonight. So again, Acts 24, the entirety, and then we're going to go through probably verses 1 through 12, 1 through 13 um, in chapter 25. And we're going to kind of begin to connect these pieces. And remember the end of our lesson last week. Um, of kind of where it all ended, you know, where now you have um, um, Paul being brought uh, actually before uh, before feet uh, before Felix, and where we kind of ended from the perspective of, of course, that plot to kill Paul, uh, and now him now having to go before centurions and commanders. Now he's going in front of politicians, <laughs> um, judges, if you will, uh, as we see that he has to continually defend his stance on the gospel of Jesus Christ on a regular basis. And we'll get into this here in a second. We'll have a word of prayer before we get started as the word of God leads us into grace and peace with him in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this time and Thank you, Lord, for the study of tonight. We ask, Lord, that you meet us in this place. And allow us, Lord, to see your glory as it goes forward in faith. We thank you, Lord, for all that you continue to do. Bless us and keep us in every way and give us what we need, Lord, on the journey of life. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to expose to us in Acts 24 and 25. And allow us, God, to just see it, to have conversation about it. Lord, to be challenged by it. Lord, to see even the subplots uh, and, and themes and sub-themes that are behind the text, O oh Lord. And let's engage it. We thank you, Father, for what your word continues to do. It becomes truly a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It leads us, it guides us, it shows us to the light, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name I pray and ask all. Amen. So with that, Acts 24. Any questions from last week? Questions, comments, anything? All right. So, we're going to get into Acts 24 on tonight, and I want you to kind of see some of the setup that kind of happens with, uh, with 24 uh, from you know, the previous chapter. So what we basically have is the positioning of Paul as he is now being led, okay, led towards uh, essentially a Roman uh, um, pro, uh, uh, procurator or procurator by the name of Felix. Okay, what we know about Felix is that Felix is um, he's Greek by nature, uh, by his origins. Um, what we will find is that uh, there are many individuals that are of different nationalities, not necessarily Roman, that are in different positions as judges, curators, um, governors, things of that nature in the Roman Empire. We're going to see that also with the aspect of King Agrippa II. And so uh, we'll see this with also Festus. But these three individuals are very, very important to this whole connection story for many reasons. Um, I won't give you, give you those yet as we get into it, but there's some things I want you all to see with regards to God's setup from the perspective of Paul. And how uh, God leads him and guides him specifically through these individuals. One of the things that we see is that um, it was prophesied, and I'm trying to remember where it was in Acts specifically. Um, I think it's in Acts 21, but I have to go back and look. 
um, again, but um, the scripture basically said that he would go before kings, before rulers, before governors, and so, and so forth. That prophecy was given. Well, now we're starting to see that come to pass. That Paul now is beginning the process of going in front of these individuals and giving proclamation of the same gospel, but in man-made high places. Now, this, this is what, why, why I kind of introduce it this way generally. Because what you will see is how the gospel gives transformation. Not only to people, not only to institutions, but ultimately it becomes placed on a stage where it has a greater worldview. It's not about the popularity of Christianity. It's about the movement of the faith into places and how God orchestrates it in order to spread. And this right here becomes really a main premise of how the gospel begins to spread throughout the known world at that time. Matter of fact, this is one of the reasons, one of the reasons why um, Christianity or the way, as we keep hearing it, the way moves to Rome. This is how it gets there. And so it's a series of conflicts by way of Paul's testimony that continues to get him in trouble, good trouble, with regards to his faith that continues to cause disturbances, but it gives more acclamation, if you will, and exhortation to Jesus Christ, even in the midst of the conflict. And that's something I think we need to kind of hold on to, because when you really think about it, it's really, and to me, an instantaneous play or replay of the cross, of the Passion Week. That out of the height of the popularity of Christ, that now the salvation moment, the salvation exercise and experience would happen at Calvary to the point where Christ would die, he would be executed, but also be raised from the dead three days later. And we now see the same proclamation happening with Paul even in this instance. Look at, look at Christ. Christ was what? Put before who? Put before the Sanhedrin. He goes before the Sanhedrin, the, court, the courts of the Sanhedrin. Because there couldn't be a decision made, they brought him to Herod. Okay? They brought him to Herod, Herod Antipas. They brought him to Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was basically, I'm, uh, I really don't want to make a decision on this, even though Pilate had said so. And since Pilate is really ruling the govern and governing our area, um, this is too hard a decision for me because I don't want half of these Jews to be on top of me because I make a decision about Christ to have him punished. Take it back to Pilate. Tell him, let's see what he says about it. Goes back to Pilate. What does Pilate do? Pilate goes through and says, okay, I find no fault in the man. I really don't. Um, but y'all have a tradition here that now says that during the Passover, you release a prisoner. And I believe in Pilate's mind, he's thinking, this, this man has done nothing wrong that deserves death, meaning Christ. So let's get the most unruly, the most despicable, the most dangerous criminal amongst the Jews, and we'll put them side by side, Jesus and Barabbas. Because Barabbas was in jail for leading an insurrection, a Jewish insurrection, where he stabbed and killed a Roman soldier. So he's on death row for murder. Jesus hadn't killed anybody. As a matter of fact, he even rose folk from the dead. And they put those two in front of the body of Judea in Jerusalem and says, we release one prisoner. You all choose. And what happens? The Sanhedrin get their cronies and make it a point to pay folks off to tell them, choose Barabbas, choose Barabbas. And because of that, they begin to shout, we want Barabbas. 
Because at this point, I honestly believe many of the folks were tired of Jesus. And what I mean by that is that the revolutionary that they hoped for in Christ to overturn the Roman government wasn't was it didn't look didn't look the same. And so they were like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Barabbas, he's stabbing and killing folk, and he trying to cause a revolution that way. Let's pick him. And also the church is paying us off in regards to it. So they must have something on this Jesus dude that, yeah, yeah, we want Barabbas. So they choose Barabbas, release Barabbas, and then Pilate asks the question, what will we do with this person named Jesus? And they holler, crucify him. And immediately they begin the process of putting him toward capital punishment and crucify him on a cross. Not knowing it was part of God's divine plan for him to get to the cross so that he could die, but to be raised from the dead three days later. Now, as we fast forward all the way to Paul, in this instance, it is almost the same replica of what happened at Calvary with Christ. The only difference is, is that Paul is on trial because of his belief in the resurrection of the dead through Jesus Christ. And truly, I believe this is what Ecclesiastes tells us. It's nothing new under the sun. And if you really fast forward today, you got many, many folks who are proclaiming Jesus Christ and are oftentimes persecuted because of the aspect of their faith, because of what they believe, because of the way that they're, they're humiliated in some way, shape, fashion, and form. And that's what we have here in Acts chapter 24. I want to read this through. Um, and then we'll pick up 25, but I want to read 24 through because there's a lot of things that are going on, especially amongst individuals and people. So I want to kind of get into this tonight as we engage the scripture. And I'm reading from the NIV version of Acts 24, and it says, Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named uh, Tertullus. And they brought their charges against Paul uh, before the governor. And Paul was called in to tell us, presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation, everywhere and in every way. Most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this was profound gratitude, with, uh, with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. Sound like lawyer talk, don't it? Yeah, yeah. We, we have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene, of the Nazarene sect, and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city, and they cannot prove to you the charges they are down making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law, and that is written in the prophets, 
And I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be uh, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present uh, offer offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they uh, found me in the temple, in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found, found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted and I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. Uh, when... Uh, Lysias, when Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some, uh, some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, uh, who was, I'm sorry, I had to start, stop right there. Wasn't that the name of, of, of somebody in a soap opera? Drus Drusilla? Yeah, I thought so. I, I, I just looked at looked the name. I said, that's that name sound for me. Um, who was uh, Jewish. Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith, uh, faith in Christ, in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. Uh, when two years had passed, Felix was, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, uh, he left Paul in prison. Okay? Now, I know this is a lot. <laughs> I mean, it just sounds like court TV. It really does. It sounds like right from the people's court, any of the court shows you watch. But the reality is, is that this now goes to some level of prosecution and defense. That now, for some reason, of course, but reasons that are conjured up by the Sanhedrin, they are bringing Paul before Felix in, in order to try to drum up a case against him. Okay. Now, we see all these players that are kind of in, in motion here. Of course, we have Felix. Felix even mentions the commander's name, which is Lysias. We see him and, and how he's going to have to possibly be brought into, brought into all this. Um, we see Tertullus, who is basically the lawyer for the prosecution. <laughs> he, he, he's the prosecuting attorney. Okay? And he gives this grand introduction trying to give praise to Felix and basically trying to brown nose with him in order so he, that he could see things his way. We have Felix, who we're finding out is a crooked, a crooked governor. Okay? And the reason why we know he's crooked is because if you look historically, there is there, there are things that are written that you might not see it in scripture, but it says that he tried to bribe Paul. Thought Paul had some money probably heard about all the offerings that Paul had gathered and he was gathering those for the churches to help the churches. So he figured, well, you know, he probably got some money or whatnot. You know, we'll try to, I'll try to bribe him, bribe him off. So I'll leave him in prison, leave him in prison to do the Jews a favor. Okay. But Felix also was known to not be the best judge. Uh, or, or governor, if you will, with regards to certain proceedings. This, this is historical. You can read this in, in, in some of the writings of Josephus and other, other individual, other uh, Israeli or Jewish uh, Hebrew uh, uh, historians. But, but, but Felix was not known 
to be very, very fair, if you will. Matter of fact, the Roman government, Rome, was really upset with him. And as a matter of fact, the reason why Festus even enters the picture is because Felix is called by Rome to come back to Rome to answer for a lot of misjudgments that he, he had done in Judea. So this is where kind of the Felix Festus aspect comes in. Now, there's a lot of history behind all this. But I also want you to see the historical picture, but I also want you to see the God picture in the midst of what's happening. That they're bringing these cases against Paul with no witnesses, with no witnesses. The witnesses they try to conjure up aren't telling the truth. Everything's being drummed up because of the way, because of the way, because of the Christian faith that now is becoming so rampant and spreading all over the known world. What also is happening? You, you have the popularity of the way, you have the individual of Paul who, because of his Roman citizenship, is very hard to touch him. So the Jews can't get to him. The reason why he's in court is because Paul had made the, made the question, he said, if I make it to Jerusalem, they got a mob on the way and they're going to kill me. They're going to murder me. Because remember, he heard from his, from his nephew. <laughs> this, is, this is a soap opera in and of itself, isn't it? And, but, but we see all this and how they're trying to come up against Paul. But also the setup of what God is doing from the perspective of the connection of how all this will orchestrate to the spreading of the gospel. Okay? Um, let me give you an example. Many people did not know Dr. William Barber about 10 years ago. I think, is that fair to say? I'm asking you, is that fair to say? I think some people knew him, but they really didn't know him on a world stage. Ten years ago, ten years ago, I knew who he was, but I, I, I did, but you know, because because of the state NAACP here in North Carolina and so forth, so I was kind of tied to that. I'm like, okay, I know who he is from that perspective. But once he began doing certain protests in Raleigh on the state capitol, when he when he started getting clergy from all over the United States, really all over the world, and they were going to jail with him over over much of the injustices had been done in the, had been done in the state but then he started going nationally with it and now when you mention his name when you mention William Bar Barber's name it is tied directly to certain activism social justice activism founded on the Christian art there are a lot of folks who say they love Christ and don't like Dr. Barber and that's very difficult for me to, to register because this man is, 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 is going through the process of speaking against injustices that I believe our Bible speaks of. And he's doing it openly, yes, but for some odd reason, you have an issue and a problem with it. So what is it affecting? Is it affecting your agenda? Is it affecting... Uh, who you would have or would like to be in positions of power? Is it affecting really injustices that are being done in this country that just have gone, have, have not been chin checked for quite some time? But because this man speaks it and tries to speak that truth and confront it, you don't like it. What I've realized is that over time, the truth of God's word, whether it's spoken on a low scale, man-made scale or a high scale, it is still the truth. And because it's the truth, it's going to shake foundations that are already shaken. It's supposed to do that. It's supposed to do that. And when you really think about Paul, what Paul is professing, they said that he tried to, he tried to create riots. 
He didn't try to create a riot. They tried to kill him. You see how lies get flipped? And so this, this is what becomes of individuals and spirits that want to try to use try to use God as their basis for their erroneous, sinful, and wretched activity. And that's why we have to be on caution with regards to these things, but also making sure we're truly standing firm on the word of God and what that truth projects. Because when we really project that truth and it begins to really transform a lot of things in and around our circles, you can get ready for the heat to come. Get ready for the backlash. It's coming. In some way, shape, fashion, or form, it's coming. Um, Reverend Dr. Barco McNeil, who has been here, he passes in Memphis, Tennessee now. He, he wrote something on Facebook that just, that, it was a quote, and it just got me, and I'm like, I'm going to use this, I'm going to use this, I'm going to use it. He said, people, people are rather, rather, people would rather tell more of a lie than the truth, because lies are more entertaining. Lies are more entertaining. There's much drama around a lie. And what we're seeing here is that there are lies being propagated against Paul. Paul ain't done nothing wrong. But they're trying to put up a Dallas, um, uh, uh, that's the old school soap opera, Dallas, Knott's Landing, that's another old school, um, Knott's Landing, um, Young and the Restless drama, soap opera, as the world turns. They're trying to put this together to say Paul's wrong. And, we're, going, and we're, 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 we're coming to court with it. And what's amazing is, is how God is even using his enemies as a footstool. It's amazing. And why am I going, I know I'm going historically about this and so forth. And why I, the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to really encourage all of us from the perspective of our faith. Because when the hellhounds come, when they come, when they start talking, when they start barking, and so forth. When, when they do that, don't get scared. Don't, don't, don't run. Don't run away. Continue doing what you're doing in Christ. Because when you hear the noise, you know there has to be something I'm doing right from the word of God. And that's why the noise is coming. That's why it's coming. Two Sundays ago, I talked about the whole aspect of that ringing, if you will. Ring the bell in order to be aware. But at some point, you can stop ringing the bell because we're already already aware. So now the bell not only not not it doesn't become just a place of awareness anymore. It now just becomes noise, and that's what some people just want to do. They want to create a whole lot of noise whole lot of noise around you, around your faith, around your beliefs. A lot of noise that has nothing to do with God's truth and what you're trying to project with regards to giving God glory and also setting captives free. And this is why we have to be careful from the perspective of our faith that when we start speaking this truth and the truth starts getting out, you can get ready for the retaliation. It's coming. It's going to come. But they don't know that God is using them as pieces on a chessboard in order to move the gospel into places where more people will hear about it. The beauty of the Internet. And I love it. Like I said, we're on, you know, we're on right now. Is that I don't know who this is going to touch. I just don't. But once it hits the airways, it's out there. It's floating. You can share it. You can send it. You can copy it and send it to somebody else. You again share it. Share it over here. Share it over there, and so forth. You never know how the gospel is going to reach someone, and so with that, it's going to come some level of attention that will come around it. Either someone trying to possess it and wants Christ themselves 
or someone who is just trying to come up against it. A wolf, a wolf in sheep's clothing, trying to come up against it to speak against that truth. Watch this. As they're arguing, or as they're arguing, meaning those who are against Paul, what you're finding is that this is the absence of uh, several years. I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me or these who are are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin unless it was one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence it is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today see Paul didn't put any pulling punches with it he said you know why I'm on trial it's because of this. It's because of that cross. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. And the reality of our faith bridges us, I believe, to a greater expectation of how God will work through his truth in order to really bring more truth and to expound upon the greatness of who God is to the point of what we can or cannot even explain because it's too big. This will go on and on and on long after we're gone. This will continue to happen. But this is why we must always put a stake in the ground and say, this is where I stand in regards to the faith of Christ and still profess it. Regardless of what people are going to do or what they're going to believe, and so forth. Because I believe that at the end of the day, we have to be true to what the word of God has told us. And also the operation of how we go through the process of living. you got all these individuals, uh, shady lawyer, shady judge, sh shady Jews who, who, are all, who are all trying to put up lies, call them the truth, and point back at Paul and say, we need to kill him. We need to throw him in prison. But all the things that, that God lines up for Paul in order to continue the message is unbelievable to me. And every place that he goes seems like it's almost a step up with regards to the testimony. So when we get to 25, let me get here in a second. When we get to chapter 25, because I told you of Felix and his shadiness, and basically Rome saying, you need to come back to Rome because you got to answer for, for some unfair and unjust rulings that you have done because you're not governing well. So what happens? They replace Felix with Festus. Okay? And now, it's almost like it's a reset. <laughs> and Paul has to go through this thing almost all all the way over again and give his testimony. And now Festus has to look at him and say, okay, am I going to do something? What am I going to do with it? But one of the things that really gets me here, and before we get really into 25, it says when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. So he left him there. Okay? He, he left him there. Shows his shadiness, really, because it says he left him there in order to give a favor to the Jews. Also, I believe it wasn't just a favor to the Jews, I believe it was a favor to himself. Also. You know why? I, I think there was some, Brother Bennett, I believe there was some monetary gain that he gained from it by keeping Paul in prison. I believe they, they or, or some level of a barter that there was something was traded for something. He said, okay, we'll give you this. We'll give you this, um, Felix, and um, you know, you keep Paul there. Keep Paul in prison. 
What I also find amazing is not just, I think, the monetary piece with, with regards to feelings. There's some, I believe there's something else here. So, if they paid him off, if they paid him off, that's kind of one thing. But I also believe there is possibly another piece that's here. And he was succeeded by Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, um, he left him in prison. I also believe that if he would have released Paul, there would have been a riot. I believe they, they would have released, if he would have released Paul, there would have been a riot because of so many Jews that were trying to kill him. If he would just released him, just released him, that it would have been a riot. Paul possibly could have been killed. Because remember, there's already a mom waiting for him. He possibly could have been killed, but Felix decides to leave him in prison, which actually is for the safety, not, not in Felix's case, but he says leave him in prison because he does something foul, meaning Felix, as far as a barter trade, gets paid off, leaves Paul in prison. Paul probably is safer in prison than he was on the outside. And I, I want you all to see that connection of God's safety in the midst of this. That even when it feels like Paul should be released, God says, no, no, leave him there. Leave, leave, him, leave him in that place. He, he's, not, he's not supposed to be there. But if he goes outside, they're going to kill him. And I got more for Paul to do. So I'd rather keep him behind bars from the aspect of an injustice that's done to him because it's probably the safest place for him even in this moment. I want y'all to think about something. Do you think, honestly believe, do you think that Dr. King would have lived, lived longer if he would have just been outside all the time and maybe not locked up? I, I, think, I, think, he, I think he still would have been killed, but I, if the reality, Brother Ben, I believe that I think he wouldn't have lived as long as he did live. Even, even in his living as long as he did, he was only 39 when he, when he died. I honestly believe that some, in some instances, being in prison for Dr. King was actually a safe haven. Yep. I really believe that. I honestly and truly believe that. In the right prison. Yeah, in the right prison, in the right circumstances. In the right, right location. But, but if, you, if you look at look at a, a, a person who has been in prison. In prison, you have a lot of time on your hands. A lot. A lot of time. Now, I'm not speaking from experience. I'm just saying I know individuals who've been in, been in prison. You may know some too. But you have a lot of time to really recap your thoughts, to really think about a lot of things, and so forth. And one thing with Dr. King, incarceration, he was never scared to go to jail. That's one thing. He, he was never scared. He, matter of fact, he was like, take me. He, 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 would, he would come and like, oh, I know I'm going to get arrested. And it's not even a question. I know I'm going to get arrested. But what you're arresting me for is unjust. So that's why I have no problem in going to jail because what you're doing, you know is wrong. And it's an insult to you every time you put the handcuffs on me. So what is it doing? It's convicting you. Even when you're trying to convict me. And I honestly and truly believe that if, if you've never read the letter from Birmingham jail, Lord have mercy. That, that, that is, that's one of the best sermons that was never preached. <laughs> when, you, when you read it, read the whole letter, Lord, how, just the thoughts that he came, the thoughts he had. And then when you understand the circumstances of how he wrote that letter, they didn't give him pad and pencil. He wrote that letter on toilet paper. He wrote that letter on toilet paper. To the point where it did not even phase him to put it down. He's like, I'm, I'm going to put this. I just need, I need something to write with. I'll take this toilet paper. And when you read that whole letter, which I think is about, comes out to about like 15 pages. It was all said and done. When you read what he has in it and also the subject matter of it and who he addresses it to, he's addressing it to preachers of the church. Man, 
When they told him, don't come to Birmingham, don't come. We don't want you here. Wait a minute, we're supposed to be worshiping the same Jesus. And you're telling me not to come? Preachers. Preachers. He wrote that to preachers. And be honest with you, who's writing, of course, to white preachers, white clergymen, many white clergymen were saying it, but also there were black clergymen who were saying the same thing and said, King, don't come. Because you're going to bring a lot of heat and a lot of fire to us. And he addressed that to clergy. One of the most powerful pieces of writing uh, uh, and just the emotion and the personal pieces that he even puts in the letter, they, 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 make, they make you cry. They make you cringe. It's like he just reached in and just grabbed your heart and said, do you feel that? Do you feel that? I, I, I bring that as an example. Because in this, God still kept Paul. God keeps all his servants until their time is up according to God and not man. What did Paul tell Timothy? Second Timothy, I think. It could be first Timothy, chapter one, verse seven. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. That is some of the most powerful scripture in the Bible. You know why? Because Paul wrote it when he was in jail. He wrote it when he was in prison, in Rome. And he knew he was about to be executed. He knew it. But he wrote that letter so he could get to Timothy. It was the only letter, other than I think Philemon, um, that was directly addressed to a person and not generally to the church or to a specific church. He writes that letter. So that people would know, people would know, at least Timothy would know, that you need to preach the word in season and out of season. Because he knew his days were, days were numbered. And that to me is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that it doesn't matter who's preaching it, as long as God has called them to preach it. But if you think you can kill the messenger and the word's going to die, God has already made it clear that his word will not return to him void. He's already made that clear. So now he's using Paul to do it. And he's going to use Paul to do it. But not before he goes before these governors and kings and whomever else. Because now he's going to be put on the world stage. Where more people are going to know about this dirt poor carpenter from the ghettos of Nazareth. By the name of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Questions, comments, anybody? I just I'm, I know there's a lot of history and, and Bible and tug, but this is really where, where the text kind of takes us, I believe, in a, lar a larger, de larger degree. Let's get into chapter 25 real quick. We're only going to go to, to uh, verse. Uh, what verse we're going to stop? We're going to stop at verse 12. It says, three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus as a favor to them. You hear that? To have Paul transferred to Jerusalem. For they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going, going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, and if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. After spending eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. The next day, he convened the court and ordered that Paul would be brought before him. When Paul came in, Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They, uh, they brought many uh, serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. Then Paul made his defense. I have, have, have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law 
or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me, uh, before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had con conferred with his counsel, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar, you will go. Why do you think it was important? Why is it important for Paul to say that? There's a few reasons. I, I want to talk about this for a second. So what he does, Paul says, they don't have anything against me. The court has no right because they have no evidence. The court has no right to bring me, to put me before them. I'm a Roman citizen. That's what he's saying. I'm a Roman citizen. So they have no right or the court has no right to bring me before them, before their counsel, because if they bring me before them, they're going to kill me. So since there's no evidence, there's no reason to hand me over. He says, right now, I'm telling you now, I appeal to Caesar right now. And the Caesar at that time was Nero, Roman emperor. Any Roman citizen could appeal to directly to the Roman, uh, to the Roman emperor. If you were a Roman citizen, you could appeal to the emperor. What that meant was, was that now... You got to go to Rome. So if you made the appeal to say, I appeal my case to Caesar, to Caesar Nero, that means that they have to, as a Roman citizen, they have to honor your request and, and, and to put you on a boat and send you to Rome, Italy to go before Nero. Let me go back to my next, my other question. Why, why is this important? Judged by the Romans, but what you also have, Brother Bennett, is because he appeals to Caesar, Festus, I believe, in my estimate, based off reading this, I believe he's going to let him go. I honestly believe he was going to let Paul go. But would have been more dangerous to let him go in Jerusalem rather than Paul appeal to Rome and even though his case is going to Rome at least he won't have to face a mob that's already waiting for him and as a matter of fact that's what the scripture actually says when you actually read it go, go to verse 13 I want you to see what, what King Agrippa says King Agrippa says, he says, a few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending uh, many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there's a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priest uh, and the elders of, of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. I told them that it is not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they have faced, uh, faced their accusers and have, have an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes, any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus, <laughs> wow, <laughs> who Paul claimed was alive. I was at a loss 
how to investigate such matters. So I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. But when Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Once you made that appeal to Caesar, in so many words, as a Roman citizen, nobody could touch you. Nobody could touch you. They had no choice. They had to put him on a boat and send him to Rome. They had no other choice. But I also believe that because of that, it also kept Paul from being killed. It kept him from being killed in that moment. Sometimes you don't know how God's operating. Sometimes you don't know that you're in a situation, the situation that you're in, that a decision is made that seems like would be, would be give you freedom could actually be the death trap. But God steps in right in the nick of time and makes it a point to put these words in Paul's mouth to the point where it saves him in order to continue the work of the church. Not only that, it also moves him into these other circles of people that now he has to continue to reverb his testimony over and over and over again. And at some point, he's going to get the wrong. And guess what? When he gets before the emperor, he's going to have to reverb his testimony once again. In front of a larger audience, in front of an audience of, again, more kings, more counsel, and so forth. Ultimately, the national religion of Rome, of the Roman Empire, eventually becomes Christianity. Ultimately. It's a, but it's amazing how God works through all this in order for something like that to happen and also for the early church to still thrive and continue to thrive in the midst of man-made opposition, even amongst high dignitaries such as Kings, governors, and the like. Questions, comments? I'm sorry, talk about, explain it further. Oh yeah, and you and they send and they send you and they send you. Oh, and they send you back. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, extradition. That's the that's the yeah. proper word. That's the legal word for it. Yeah. So they will extradite you yeah. back, back to wherever the place is. Right. The crime was committed, or in this case, where no crime was committed, but because yeah. but because Paul raised his hand, says, "I appeal this to Caesar." That that shut the case down right there. Because once he appealed it to Caesar, they were like, okay. And I honestly believe Festus was about to let him go. I honestly believe he was about to let Paul go. He was about to let him go. Why would he, why would he even talk to King Agrippa that way and explain all this? And he says, but everything pretty much stopped right when Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. But once he did that, case get, the case moves down from um, um, district court <laughs> district court to now go move to Supreme Court yeah he, Roman uh, pro, 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 uh, procurator which they best is governor yeah. governor yeah Uh huh. And from yep. There, yep. All the Jewish customs and everything and whatnot to his, to his white house, they lived in one 
Uh huh. Yeah, he was also a slave. And doing all this too. I mean, it don't make. I mean, it shows you how fate was working and how it's working still today through positions. Positions, exactly. And even, even, even Agrippa. Agrippa is actually you're gonna find Agrippa is a Jew. Agrippa is a Jew. And this is amazing how all, but see, it's what Paul says in front of Agrippa that just really rims it. It's what he said, because he, 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 the testimony is getting stronger, if you ask me. But what he says in front of Agrippa, which we, that'll be kind of a remainder 25 going at the end of 26, what, how, how Paul talks about, he, he gets real personal. He gets real personal. And maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe Paul said, since I'm now at this stage in the midst of all this, I've gone through, this is now level number three, I guess, that I'm about to go through. Let me give the full testimony of who I am, where I came from, how I was educated, where God brought me from in order to get before you right now. And when you start talking personal about your own personal testimony, it doesn't throw the Bible out the door. What it does is it brings the word of God to life. And it says that now this thing is not just about history, but it becomes utterly personal for you because now this is the journey that I've been through. It's not just some words and some scholarly words that have been placed there. It's not just the aspect of readings in history through ancient Near Eastern uh, culture and so forth, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not just about the Mosaic Law. It's not just about these uh, particular things. But now, it has now become personal. And since you want to put me on display, I'm going to put God on display. And I'm going to put God on display in such a way that it's not about being braggadocious. It's not about... Uh, being haughty in any way, but I'm going to show you how personal this walk is with Jesus for me. And that's exactly what Paul does. Because when you read when you read 26 and how he brings it out, oh God, it's so deep. I mean, it, it is not depth, depth from an intellectual level. It's depth from a spiritual level and you can sense it. You can feel it. You can even feel the... Uh, just the power of God moving out of Paul and being showcased by his testimony. Amazing. Because at that point, I believe Paul was like, look, I'm going to put it all out there for you. I'm a Pharisee among Pharisees. That's who I am. My name, my name used to be Saul of Tarsus. You might have heard of it. And he goes through that testimony. Of how God can change and transform and transmogrify you and move you to a place spiritually in connection with him that is far beyond the expectations of what most people can ima would, would have imagined for you. But remember, that's his testimony. It's personal. It's not strategic. It's not about lies. It's not about anything else. It's about his walk. With God. And when your walk with God becomes that animate, when you really think about where God has really brought you from, there's a fire that comes with that. There's a fire that comes with that and a passion that comes with that. When you really think about it, because when you start to really talk about how God led you and moved you, how God saved you and how God healed you and how God did, done all these things for you and how God moved you into this space. And when people tried to surround and encamp around me, I understood what, uh, what David was saying when he tried to encamp around me and try to destroy me and eat my flesh, that God sent uh, uh, basically uh, uh, made, made, the, made my enemies a footstool where I could actually step above them and around them where I could move briskly and freely by way of the power of God because of the mercies of God because the intention and the will of God had not yet been decided for me as of yet but I understand now at least in part what God has done in my life and because of that that testimony is so big maybe Paul understood that we know in part and we prophesy in part. But then we shall know fully as we're fully known. But that part that God gives us in our testimony is so big. It's so big. And as long as we continue living 
in Christ, it'll become even bigger, even larger. Mm. Mm -hmm. he, he, he was the, the one that uh, the prosecutor, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now when he was saying we are lied to the people, look what sect they brought. The, they brought the sect and didn't even believe in the resurrection. Well, we have five sects of as we can see uh, of, yeah. of, um, of, Judea, of Judaism. So now the accusers came, those were the ones that didn't believe in the resurrection. Re resurrection. Sanhedrin, yeah. Sanhedrin didn't believe in the resurrection. That's the one that he brought to make all these accusations. Where's my accuser? Yeah. Sounds for me, doesn't it? Take him high court. Jesus, Jesus, start writing on you. Jesus started writing on you. Those without sin cast the first stone. And like I said, to this day, we don't know what Jesus wrote. But I can only imagine. I always go to names. Whoever was standing out there, he's probably writing their names down. And then looked, and then probably looked at them. Yes. He had, he had like yeah, three, it was three wives. History reading, I, it was, I think it was three wives that he had. And, Fe, and he and Felix were, were, were actually somewhat related. They were cousins, if I'm not mistaken, because of, of, of um, um, Drusilla. Drusilla, it, it, it's it's a whole mixed bag. So exactly, it's a whole mixed bag of stuff. And so again, this whole popularity thing kind of goes out the window. Well, not goes out the window. That's what you, they try to raise everything on, and they still can't. They still can't get get the aspect of who Paul is in Christ, and. They're trying to look at this thing legalistically. And Paul is saying, okay, if you want to try to do that, then I'm just going to appeal to Caesar because at the end of the day, I I'll take this thing to wrong. I'll take it to wrong. Now, that may be Paul's thinking. I'll take this to wrong, so I'll, I'll, so I'll you know, take this thing to wrong because it's completely unjust. But maybe God was also orchestrating that way so that Paul wouldn't land in the hands of the Sanhedrin council. And ultimately, that, that angry Jewish mob and ultimately be killed at that moment. What am I trying to say? God supplies protection over his servants and over his church. And even if it's the will of God for someone to perish, it's the will of God for that to happen. But his church will never die. His church, what did he tell Peter? Man. He said, Peter, your, your name is Peter. Your name is Petros. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Any hell hound that comes, they better be ready. Because my church is not going to fall. Wow. Baptist. Exactly. Because it was actually Herod, Herod Agrippa. Herod Agrippa is, I think, the great grand is the great grandson. He's the great grandson of uh, of the Herod that went before John the Baptist. That um. um the Herod that John the Baptist went in front of. I'm gonna find I'm gonna find a family tree on that. <laughs> no, that's there's one, that's some out there. I gotta find a family tree to connect it all. Uh, but he's part of the the, 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 the family lineage of of these uh, curators and, 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 and lighter kings, if you will. Um, uh, in, in in the Bible and specifically as you look at the book of Acts. Questions and comments. I know I'm over my time, y'all. Um Questions or comments? Because when we come back next week, we're going to kind of finish this, uh, hopefully finish 25 and, and, and jump right in. Yeah, we should be able to jump right into 26. But you're going to see some things there again in 26. Um, 
with regards to that testimony of Paul. And it's it's some of the strongest language in the scripture. I think just the personal, the personal aspect of it, how he how he relays it, it's it's so powerful. It's so powerful. Uh, I've heard many you, you, there are many sermons that come out of Acts 26 just because of that testimony and how strong it is. Questions or comments? Well, I want to thank y'all for tonight. I know I bounced around in history a little bit with regard, but I think you had to in this text because you got to kind of understand the pieces that are there and how it all ties in. But remember, it's still God's will. God's is still God's will and it's still God's plan. So with that, again, for everyone online, thank y'all for joining us tonight. I know some folks are out there, Sister Wilkes, uh, Prudence, um, Deacon Scott, uh, Sister Mr. Scott, Sister Terrell Dudley. Thank y'all for joining us on today. We have prayer and be dismissed on today. God's blessings. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this text on tonight. Uh, Lord, there's so much that's going on there, God, in this, uh, this, this soap opera drama, God, it seems. But God, you orchestrated all of this in order to teach us multiple lessons. Multiple lessons when, it, Lord, is first of all, it's your will that's going to be done, period. Second of all, God, that you're using us, O oh Lord, on the chessboard of life in order to give testimony to not only your existence, but to your saving grace and power. Thank you, Lord. Even in this lesson, it helps us to understand testimony that we should be able to give, but also the orchestration of how things go, that no one is above, Lord, no person, no man that... No person that you have created is above what you are going to do, and what your will will do. Thank you, Father, for that. So we leave this place, but not for your presence. Give us mercies wherever we're going and allow us, Lord, to see your glory as we persist and move forward in life. Thank you, Lord, for the testimony of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray and ask all. Amen.